All right, everybody, it's Tuesday night at seven o'clock and we have a special guest with us this evening, largely considered one of the fastest men to ever don the black and gold for Vanderbilt Commodores coming straight out of Nashville. Originally, now he lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Of course, we've got Preston Brown with us. Good evening, Preston. How are you doing, my friend? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying life right now. But most of all, thank you for this opportunity to come on your show. Oh, this is not only is it my pleasure, it's my honor uh, for folks who uh, are I just I'm so glad that you're here tonight is the best thing that I can say. Um, and guys, for those of you who join us each week, um, we're trying not only to build a community of Commodores of all generations, all decades, but each week we're telling the oral history of our program. Mm -hmm. And we've had Commodores from the 1950s all the way to players from last year and current team. So we've had guys that spanned all the decades. And the beautiful thing is, is we all have our own individual memories and experiences, but there's a lot of commonalities. And mm -hmm. some of that involves that field directly behind me that's getting a big old facelift right now. Yes. And I'm so excited. We're, this is week zero. We got Hawaii Saturday, all kind of great changes. So anyway, we're going to jump into the Preston Brown story and before we get to your your origins catch up okay. what are you doing these days and and where is home and just kind of catch up folks who hadn't been part of your life lately okay yes um once again thank you for having me here um i have been living in huntsville alabama ever since i was uh drafted by the new england patriots back in 1980 uh and i made huntsville my home i married a girl at vanderbilt uh linda Brown, who's no longer with us now. She uh, passed away uh, some 12 years ago. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons for my calls, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, I, I have five grandkids. Uh, we, have, uh, we have two daughters. And uh, like I said, I've been living here in Huntsville. I've actually been a finance director for a car dealership for some 30 years. And uh, Derry Damson Honda was the name of the store. And just recently retired. I retired after um, uh, 28 years of service over there. And then um, uh, COVID came. When COVID hit in 2020, uh, a lot of things changed. And uh, I just decided to get out of it at the time. But, but I, you know, as you know, I played professional football. I was drafted uh, by the New England Patriots in 1980. And uh, having left Vanderbilt and uh, just had some great memories at Vanderbilt, um, was glad to have the chance to play at Vanderbilt and to uh, to go to school and get a degree uh, from Vanderbilt University. So that's a wonderful memory for me. Uh, but then I went on and played for the Patriots, uh, the New York Jets, the Cleveland Browns, and even the Memphis Showboats of the USFL. I was there all those years. So and uh, in, in the meantime and in between time, I had a career in the automobile business, enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed it in sales. Uh, I'm very active at my church at Lakeside United Methodist Church. Um, I uh, preached at a praise and worship service for some, I don't know, eight years, nine years. And because of that, uh, I wrote a book. I wrote a book called A Champion Game Plan for Life. Uh, back in 2018, uh, and it's basically, you can call them many sermons. But uh, the thing about these books, uh, it, it uh, when I lost my wife of 30 years, you know, a lot of people can go the wrong direction. You know, when they lose somebody, something tragic happens like that. Uh, a lot of people have uh, same similar stories that they can tell. But this book is designed to get people back on track. If you've lost somebody or if you've started messing around with drugs or anything like that, or unexpected pregnancy for some of these women out there. Um, but but I've got chapters. It's a little daily devotional chapters in each one of the books uh, that uh, that will give you some kind of inspiration and motivation to change, to change your life around and get yourself back on track. Uh, and because I write for a, a weekly uh, newspaper, um, the Valley Weekly, uh, I had to have material, so I just kept going with it. And then uh, my next book out that I just released in April, it's called Spiritual Game Plans for a Successful Life. 
both of these books that you can pick up on Amazon.com, if you don't mind me getting the plug in there. No, I've already plugged it once in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, but Bernie, that's, that's me. Uh, I'm married again. I'm married again. I'm married to um, uh, Terry Brown. She has touched. She has taken me on the other half of my journey, uh, praise the Lord, and uh, I am so glad that I met her here in Huntsville, Alabama. She's from New York, of all places, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of good things happened to me in New York when I was with the Jets. I had probably perhaps my best year uh, as an NFL player, you know, because I returned, I was uh, top five in kickoff returns that year as far as averages, and um, just enjoyed, enjoyed my, uh, my time there. Uh, Playing in the NFL for all these young guys out there, it's a it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, you just gotta you gotta do it right. Be a kid, you know, learn the game, be passionate about the game, and um, and that's how you you um, experience success. Yeah. Well, that and and the fact that you you were born with these God given abilities <laughs> that you you honed over mm -hmm. the years, and we're gonna get back to that, but. We got too many Commodores that want to say hello to you. Okay. Uh, before we get too far, we got Christy Hauk in the house. Christy, yes. Hey, Christy. We got What's one of my on? teammates, the pride of Pensacola, New Jersey, Eugene Keenan. Hey, Gene, how you doing? You know Good to see you Friday. And we got yeah. one of your teammates, Preston. We Ooh. got Mark Matlock. He says, great to see you, brother. Great classmate, player, and friend. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you saying those kind words. Well, guys, of course, we've got Preston Brown in the house. And, and Preston, I got to ask you, for someone who was born with zero speed, developed <laughs> no speed, but playing quarterback, I didn't really need it. Uh, what does it feel like? Because you've had so many of these. What is it? You've got to take us into the mindset of the kick and punt returner who takes it to the house. What is yeah. that mindset? And 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 do you really feel the wind go right by you? <laughs> you got to share a little bit of that insight with us. Well, okay. Um, when I returned one for 108 yards against Ole, Ole Miss, mm -hmm. uh, we were playing in Hemingway Stadium at the time. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, a, a couple of things have to happen. First of all, nobody needs to hold or have a block in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that is very disappointing for a kickoff return man. Uh, and then you do need at least one block. And I would suggest you not letting the kicker tackle you because they're going to be your last defense. So, but yeah, when you see a crease and uh, you just run like the wind because you always feel like somebody must, they must have an angle. They got to have an angle. There's no way this is going to be this easy, you know, and you just kick it up a notch. The next thing you know, you're in the end zone and there are no flags. And that's always a good thing. And then as far as the punt returns, same thing, you know, you got to have some blocking from your players. Uh, when we were playing with the, when I was with the New York Jets, we had an excellent return team and uh you, you had to have a block or two here and there you had to have some things go your way and then you just let your god-given talents take up the rest of it and that's why you're back there because you can run fast but uh yeah, yeah. it helps it helps when you have some teammates blocking for you preston you you may have been just prior to the big screen stadium scoreboards but it seems in the last say 20 years some of these kickers, can, uh, kick returns, they can see themselves, they can glance if they're mm -hmm. running toward the scoreboard to see who is behind them. I don't think you had that luxury, did you? Bernie, we didn't have that. We didn't have that. <laughs> you when did I was, it the real way. way. <laughs> yeah, we had to do it the real way. And you know, no, no, we didn't have anything like that. And um, the, the way the game and technology has progressed is just awesome and amazing. Uh, and a lot of times I do, you know, say, hey man, you know, that was that was then, this is now, but um, I mean, they have it good now. They do, they have it. It's a different game than the game that we played uh, back in the uh, 70s, the late 70s and the early 80s is just completely different. And when you watch some of those games, I've had very few of them on tape, but I've watched a few. Uh, and it's just a different speed. It's a, it's just different. A lot of times, especially in the NFL, 
you know, a lot of times all they wanted to do was run the ball. I mean, so as a wide receiver, you could not, you could not get yours in. But even at Vanderbilt, uh, I happened to have the um, Tennessee Vanderbilt game my, my senior year. And um, that was, it was fun. I don't know how I happened up on it, but it was fun uh, reminiscing and looking back on some of those years and, you know, the way we did things. It was just, I'm like, hey, who is that skinny guy out there? <laughs> but is there any better feeling that how quickly as a visiting player at Old Miss to quiet that crowd in one play? <laughs> I mean, it's an awesome feeling. Um, when that happened, that was, it was silence, silence, they said. But uh, yeah, it is a, it's an awesome feeling. And um, also one of the other things you're trying to do, uh, Bernie, is try to catch your breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. But I'm uh, sure. it was, it's, 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 it's very, it was very exhilarating mm -hmm. to uh, to make a touchdown like that. And uh, for it to be 108 yards and, is something that they can't take away from you because it uh, back then I think they only recognized 100-yard uh, kickoff returns. But I'm here to set the record straight. I was deep, deep, deep in the end zone. And, and the other one I tell you what was um, when I had a punt return against Arkansas, mm -hmm. 90 yards. Mm -hmm. um, and the only reason that it was 90 yards was I didn't know where I was. So you're supposed to let the ball go. <laughs> if it's behind the <laughs> 10. Let it go if it's, it's past the 10. Yeah. So, but the ball went over my head and I had to catch up with the ball. And by the time I caught the ball, it was on the 10 yard line. Well, I just circled around mm -hmm. and there you have it. It was just, and that was a crowd in Arkansas. Back then they thought they were big dogs and stuff, yeah. but uh, that crowd was hush. Hush, hush, hush. But that was a great feeling, too. Thank you for allowing me to rem reminisce. <laughs> oh, that's why we're here. We got, oh, we got some of you. We got Kenny Cole in the house. Well, All right. Kenny technically is at the James Taylor concert, and he said he's going to catch it on replay and get up with you later. We got O.J. Fleming. O.J. Russ, Russ Nicole. We got uh, Mark Matlock said it was that return was 1978 against Arkansas. He remembers that one. Exactly. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, awesome. Well, Preston, let's back up even further. Let's talk about growing up in Nashville in the okay. early seventies and being in the in the shadow of of Nashville. Or excuse me, of the Vanderbilt campus. Yeah, were you aware of two two things: the okay. talent, the athletic talent that was in the city of Nashville, whether it was basketball, track, football, baseball, whatever it was. And the pipeline of players that eventually, particularly African American players, that were finding their way to campus, you know, led obviously by Perry Wallace and many others. Yeah. But were you aware of this as a child or middle school or high school? Or or I guess I should ask it this way: when did it become a, when were you aware of of I'll call it a pipeline, but there certainly yeah. was a lot of players who made their way across town to campus and played for Vanderbilt. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that we thought that we all could do, we thought that we could all make a difference at Vanderbilt. We had a lot of good talent that went to Vanderbilt. Uh, but as far as coming up in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, growing up there and playing football and running track there, I was just trying to be the best version of myself that I could be. I wasn't necessarily, uh, Bernie, trying to be um, politically correct or any of that stuff like that. Uh, I just felt like that that I was I was good at what I was doing. I was good at running track. I, you know, I had the state record in the hundred yard dash, state record in the two twenty, uh, state record in the four by four four by one hundred relay. So, um, and thank God, um, you know, they they voted me trackman of the year. Uh, I was NIL player of the year that year, and has since been inducted into the the Hall of Fame. Uh, for for doing that. But as far as the pipeline, I knew that we had some great talent in that area and not a, not just that area, but the surrounding areas as well, as well, like McMinnville, Mac, Tennessee, uh, um, Columbia, uh, with John Corner up there. Uh, we had people like um, just all over the place. There, there were some other guys um, that did quite well in their careers as well. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed with I enjoyed the hope that we presented as far as coming to Vanderbilt 
and hoping that we could make a, uh, an effective difference and an effective change uh, with, uh, with, with the uh, Vanderbilt Commodores. Well, well, Preston, I don't know if Vanderbilt had a track program back then or much of one, but no. why didn't you go run track at one of these established programs around the country with all the success that you had? I guess what swayed you to go the Vanderbilt foot and football route as opposed to, to running for Arkansas or UCLA or one of these great programs, historic, that have done yeah. so well? Uh, that's a very good question, and uh, I'll answer it this way: timing. Mm -hmm. Timing was everything. Remember when you're you get recruited in the fall, mm -hmm. you signed a letter of intent, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in the early spring or so. In, in February, track, typically. I did not mm -hmm. believe it or not. I did not start running track until my senior year in high school. Oh, I didn't realize. It's the only year that I ran track. And I did it because I had a coach that talked me into it. And um, and I did it for him more than anything. I did not know that I knew I was fast, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was going to be breaking records and doing all this kind of stuff like that. So uh, we just didn't have any knowledge. And at that particular time, I had already signed my letter of intent to go to Vanderbilt University. Now, there was some discussion about possibly running track, but at that particular time, Vanderbilt didn't have an, an established uh, track program, which uh, it, it hampered me from running track because let's face it, if you if you sign a football scholarship, uh, you have some chores and some duties that you have to live up to, sure. like spring football. Mm -hmm. They want you to participate in that. They don't want you to miss miss out on some of the uh, the growth that you could have in football. So that's exactly one of the reasons why I did not go to, but I, I actually, I still wanted to go to Vanderbilt. I still wanted, I actually wanted to run track for Vanderbilt. And we had some, me and uh, Coach Pankos, we had uh, some discussion about it and um, it was eventually ruled out. And I just, well, I have a football scholarship. I'll just have to roll with it the way I can. But, you know, as far as, you know, there were, it was an unlimited possibility of what could have happened because my 100-yard time was one of the fastest in the country. Mm -hmm. It was up there with uh, Johnny Lamb Jones, uh, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the guy from Harvey Glantz from Auburn. We all had similar times in the 100-yard dash in the 220. So, and all of those guys were on the Olympic team. Right. They went to, yeah, they went to Olympic. I could have very well been, have, had done that. But, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I'm still loving life. You know, you, you can't, you you know, all I can do is just what I can do with what I have and be the best version of myself. And we'll go from there. A absolutely. And guys, I've got, of course, Preston Brown with us as our guest this evening. Preston, you talk about timing and, you know, it, it's it's timing is is funny because it can go one way and help you and it can go the other way and and not as as helpful. But you're you're signing was obviously Vanderbilt's to Vanderbilt's benefit, as well as, as yourself. Who was in your class? And I know you're not going to remember them all. Don't feel bad if you don't remember. Who were some of your buddies from that signing class? Who did you room with? Who who did you later just keep mm -hmm. those friendships with? Well, uh, first of all, let me say this. Uh, he wasn't in my class. He was just behind me was Wayman Bugs, And we eventually, mm -hmm. uh, we eventually roomed together on the road. When I was a senior, he was a uh, junior. But some oh, of the people. I, I would have wanted to have been a fly on the wall for that. Wayman was on here. Oh, a few my goodness. Back, as you know, holy smokes, what an awesome set of stories he shared. And oh, he my goodness. And he left out names. And I'm not putting you on the spot. Statue of limitations has long expired. If you want to spill the beans tonight, it's all <laughs> <to> you. <laughs> so you and Wayman roomed together one year. Me, me and Wayman roomed together. But there was also Frank Mordica. He was in uh -huh. my class. We roomed my senior year. Um, uh, Ronald Hill, God rest his soul. He was in my 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 year. Uh, um, it was uh, John Pointer, one of my best friends. Um, and we try, to, we try to stay in touch some today, you know, as much as we can today. Uh, but I tell you, um, one of the biggest influence on on my career was uh, was David Wayne Cully, uh, mm -hmm. Coach Cully. He was my first coach 
uh, that I recognized as a coach. He was my wide receivers coach sure. when I was a senior, when I was full of myself, you know, when I was, I wasn't as humble. I was very prideful. And it was his first year being a, a wide receivers coach. And he really, I, I started growing under David Cully's coaching abilities. Now, who knew that he was going to be the head coach of the Houston Texans? Who That's knew? Right. That's you right. know, maybe I would have stayed in touch a little bit enough. But uh, anyway, but yeah, those are some of the people that were uh, in my class. Uh, Kenny Cole was a, a, around during that time as well. And we had some very talented guys. Uh, uh, Ron Myrick, who was uh, just a beast at corner, God rest his soul. Um, there's a lot of people that were there and they were just very talented. Uh, people like uh, Terry Potter uh was there um from goodlessville and um you, you can't Terry, leave out the pride of valley head alabama i'm sorry you cannot leave out the pride of valley head alabama kenny hammond. Ken kenny hammond. hammond yeah i'm sorry kenny hammond my man kenny yeah, well, he's such but a he was, wallflower he was, you know he, was he, a, sits, he, he, he has such a timid personality. We forget about him sometimes. But Kenny Hammond, Kenny Hammond, he was a a, a year or two behind me, I, uh -huh. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah he was. So, he was. Uh, but yeah, but the team that we had during that time, um, they were also uh, Brenard Wilson. We had a really, they had a great defense during the time. And, you know, you just need a couple of breaks. You need a couple of breaks to get some wins. Uh, and, and your whole career, your whole season, can put, pretty much change around. You know, Scotty yeah. Madison was on here a few weeks ago, and he he said his very best game when he got to play some quarterback was the Air Force game because he handed that ball off to Frank Mordica, who set the record over three hundred record. Yeah, rushing. <laughs> Frank was a beast. Let me tell you, uh, Frank made me want to change to wide receiver because he was that good in, as a running back. Now, we could have had a pretty decent dynamic duo in the backfield, but we needed some creative play calling at the time. And sometimes, you know, when you've got your coaches, they want to get the, the ball in the hands of their superstars, and it's a challenge for them to create plays for everybody. Yeah. Um, so, uh, And they just try to go with what works. And what works for me was throwing me the ball on the outside or, or letting me fly up down the field and, and catch a long touchdown pass that way. But um, I can't blame them for what they were doing as far as our offense is concerned. Sure. Matter of fact, we, we, put, we put up some points my senior year. We sure did. We just, the defense, we, we just <laughs> allowed more points than we scored. That's all. Preston, did you live on campus all four years or did you ever live at home or, or off no, campus? No, no, I, I lived mostly off campus, except for my, um, let's see, my senior year, you know, yeah, my uh, my junior year, I lived on campus. One of those years. I didn't live, but I wasn't on campus that many times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it wasn't at home home. I, I had an off-campus residence, is mm -hmm. more likely. Uh, matter of fact, no, I lived in the dorms my freshman year because we were in Dyer's uh dorm and then we um second year when we the towers were there i lived there and i think i lived there up until my senior year then i had an off off address i'm gonna throw some names and i want you to tell me what what comes to mind with these guys okay I, and i'm listing you in this group for a reason okay mike ralston preston brown and ronnie myrick the three of y'all in 1979 were the team captains. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you your senior year? You know, that that meant an awful lot to me um, because, you know, your peers, they vote for, for you to be the captain or not be the captain. Mm -hmm. And um, it was such an honor uh, playing at Vanderbilt anyway. But by the time you got to your senior year, mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a lot of seniors. Okay, that was still there. So um, people looked up for uh, for for guidance, for inspiration. And you know what? I wasn't really that much of a talker. That's why I was wondering why they wanted me to be as a captain because I didn't talk that much, but I let my my uh, my actions speak 
for myself when I was out on the field. I was just tireless and relentless and I wanted us to win, you know. And and the one of the things about, you know, winning, you have to just you just have to hate losing mm -hmm. more than anything, you know, as long as you can accept um as long as you can stand for something long enough and and you're okay with it, you know, that that's when you run into trouble. If you just ha you just got to hate losing and that, it taught me a lot of things cuz I wasn't used to losing. You know, because I came from uh, Maplewood High School, we won all of our games. Mm -hmm. You know, I hardly ever played a fourth quarter when we played played at Maplewood. And uh, but we had great athletes at Vanderbilt, and we were good enough to win a lot of those games. Mm -hmm. But a funny thing happened on the way to the football field. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you do need some breaks. You do need the ball to bounce your way sometimes, and sometimes they just did not do it. When we were there, and I'm hoping that this year with this new Vanderbilt team, I hope that the ball, you know, bounces their way this year because uh, it, they they've got a chance. Like if they can get past these first four games before they, um, I think their first SEC game is what Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, uh, but if they can get past people like that, Wake Forest is is unpredictable. We were in that game with Wake Forest, and then all of a sudden it just a mistake here and there just kind of cost us that game. So, but uh, I'm looking for good things. We have, we certainly have the talent, just like we had the talent back then. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go down a different rabbit hole. No, no, this, I'll go anywhere you want to go with this, but <laughs> Preston, with your years in the ministry, with yes. your years uh, doing finance with the auto dealership. Yeah. It, it does not appear the current version of Preston Brown is the quiet version. And what I mean by that is not, not insulting at all, sure. meaning you express yourself, you communicate through your words. Mm -hmm. And and I was, as a child, and even up through getting to Vanderbilt, I was a pretty quiet guy. I, I wasn't one of those vocal leaders. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were kind of a similar personality, but at some point, you came out of your shell, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm mischaracterizing no, that. No. But was it the years in the NFL that brought it out? Or was it after you retired? Do you, do, do you sense or do you recall kind of a shift, if you will, in your personality to change the type of leadership style? Does that right. make sense? That, yeah. That, I mean, not only does it make sense, but that is a great question. Um, when I was playing in the NFL, I was a completely different person. And I would have loved, you can't go back and do things over, but I would have loved to play under this version of myself right now mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, the way I, I look at life, I view life, you know. You know, when I, um, when I became saved and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, uh, mm -hmm. I just became a new person on the inside, a person that just didn't hold back anymore. And I was very vocal that's why they wanted me to preach the word. And when I started preaching the word, I said, hey, hey, I've got something to say. How about that? But uh, and I wasn't as vocal when I was coming at, when I was in the NFL, nor was I that vocal when I was playing uh, at Vanderbilt. Um, and, I, and I, you know, the, the old adage, I wish I knew then what I know now. Um, well, sure. But sure. but but hey, you know, it is what it is. Uh, another cliche. It is what it is, and uh, I'm I'm okay with it. I'm okay with where I am in my life. Uh, my dad, who passed away the same year my wife did, he used to always tell me, Preston, I wouldn't take anything for my journey, and I'm the same way because every all of those experiences they have shaped me okay. into the person that I am today, and uh, and I like this person. Mm -hmm. I like this person. He's he's a good guy and he will uh <laughs> he will try to win you over and try to sell his books to you as well, spiritual game plans for a successful life as well as champion game plans for life. These are great inspirational books. Get them today at amazon.com. But anyway, let's go. But, don't you yeah, have let's a, go. Uh, Don't you have a book signing coming up or was it recent in Houston? I mean in Huntsville. Man you are right on time. I do have a book signing coming up, uh, the uh, hosted by Abba's Daughters Ministries. 
and uh, I will be, uh, and that's going to be this Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the, it'll be the same time. I think that they're playing um, Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, but it's Saturday, August 26th, here at Madison, uh, Madison, Alabama, mm -hmm. and it's going to be at the Madison Library from the times of 11:30 to 3:30. So I'll still be able to catch the game uh, a little bit later on. But yes, uh, and I'm going to, I plan on having a book signing as well. I had one last year at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. around, um, I think it was around maybe homecoming, maybe a little bit earlier than that, but I plan on setting it up when I come up for the Alabama A&M game. Uh, I'll try to get that set up. So hopefully y'all can come on out. Excellent. Excellent. See, come see me. Let's, uh, let's step back. I want to go back to the, the your campus days. Uh-oh. And, and I want you to kind of put yourself in the mindset of the, the 18, 19, 20-year-old version of you. <laughs> We're all knuckleheads at that age. We all, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go, no, go ahead. Uh, you know, ahead, it, mo most of us at that age, we're knuckleheads. We're trying to yeah. figure out life. We're, yes, yes. We, we all have varying levels of maturity. Some of us were mature at age eight. Some of us don't mature until we're 58. But anyway. <laughs> what what was important to you during those first couple of years you're 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 at even though you're across town you're in a completely different world you're playing sec football you're mm -hmm. on a largely white populated student body campus but you're insulated as many have said with the football program for the most part yeah but you've also got the historically black Colleges around town that I know that a lot of players found friends and friendships uh, going and visiting back and forth. I guess I'm kind of rambling, but what was important to you as a, a freshman and a sophomore, junior? And I'm not talking about your football career necessarily, sure. everything else. What was important? Hmm. Another great question. Um, and I hopefully I can get you a good answer. Uh, at that at that particular time, if I take myself back then, you know, I was going through a few things. Uh, but here again, mostly I was trying to be the best version of myself that I could be at that particular time. I will have to say this. My mother, Dr. Carolyn Brown, who also is a graduate of George Peabody College at Vanderbilt, uh, she, she got her doctorate's degree. And she is really the reason why that I went to Vanderbilt. She wanted me to go to Vanderbilt, even though Tennessee and Alabama and all these other teams were recruiting me. 100% um, she wanted me to go to uh, Vanderbilt. And I bring this up to say this, I grew up in a household that we didn't necessarily teach color, if that makes sense. Uh, there was not a whole bunch of distinctions. This person's a black dude, this is a white dude. You know, I just tried to make friends as they came. I did not necessarily ask myself, because of the way my mother would teach us, uh, I didn't necessarily see color. So when I got over to Vanderbilt, uh, you would have to tell me that there were, hey, you're a black dude. You know, you're a black dude, right? <laughs> I'm like, who told you that? No, but, uh, and, and don't get me wrong now, I'm not, I'm not trying to say this to say that I was naive, but all the people that know me, I mean, I, I, there wasn't, you know, I didn't see race. And, and, the, and the thing is, it's, it's, it's harder now being older because so many of my friends, they grew up where they saw race. And I didn't have the same perspective that they have. We, me and another guy that used to work for me at the, uh, an automobile dealership, he would always describe things in a different way. And I was like, mm, I didn't see it like that. I saw it like blah, 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 blah. You know, and you would say that and they're like, well, you, you know, I don't know where you grew up. And I'm like, well, I, I, there are just certain things. And then uh, not only that, it's all, a, it's all a matter of your mindset. You know, if that's, if that's what you want to see, you know, but I chose to see the positive things in life. Now, I know that sounds like pie in the sky and like, yeah, but you had some problems. Yes, absolutely. 100%. I had a lot of problems. You know, I was uh, I was easily persuaded, you know, when it came to doing goofy things, as you talked about, you know, yes, I like to have a good time every once in a while. But at the end of the day, you know, my parents raised me well. Uh, my dad was a pastor. 
My dad was a pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church. And, uh, but my mother was Episcopalian, okay? Mm -hmm. So as a child growing up, you know what that meant? That means I had, see, because the Seventh-day Adventists, they go to church on Saturday. Episcopalians go on Sunday. So as a child, that meant I went to church on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't know anything about anything except just going to church on Saturday and Sunday. And that was like a bummer. Let me tell you something. I wasn't like born again. Like right. I hear about some of these guys being born again at eight. I was born again at eight. I was born again at 12 and 13. I'm like, I was not. Let me tell you that. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. Not necessarily proud of it, but I mean, but we live in a time now that uh, there is a racial divide. I talk about a lot of it in one of my books, Spiritual Game Plans for Life. And I talk about uh, we have to come to the point where we can learn how to be not divided. You know, there's so much divisiveness, so many things that divide this country. It, it is just amazing. And, uh, and until you start seeing, perception is everything. Until you start seeing things differently, You'll never change. We will never change. Now, I, know, I understand those that have had a background that is full of hatred, mm -hmm. you know, but in, in, in God's world, it, it's not hatred. He's love. God is all about love. And uh, if, if you're trying to gravitate towards anything that's hateful or hatred, then you're not in, you're not part of God's kingdom. Did you experience any of that in the student body? Uh, during your time or on the team or or was it really the other way meaning you guys were all part of the same team regardless of your backgrounds and your race or your religion whatever it was yes yeah. did, did you see harmony that way you or know I saw I, I can only speak for myself I can't speak for others I saw harmony with with the way I treated my fellow teammate mm -hmm. and so and in turn you know, when you treat somebody a certain way, they almost are, you know, maybe in a situation where they have to treat you back a certain way. Now, you can have some some disagreements and stuff like that. You know, I get that. And even when I got in the NFL, I recognize I recognize where people came from. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they make their choices based on their upbringing. You know, so when you get mad at a person, when you started, when you start hating on somebody, what you're doing is you're hating that person's background. You know, mm -hmm. whoever raised this guy, they failed them. They didn't teach them what was right and what was wrong. They taught them one way. And sometimes just one way is not the truth. Yeah. And see, we all need to learn the truth and then make your own judgment about people. And I guess I was so interested, even back then, in knowing the truth. And even the truth of who I was, you know, that that some of those things, you know, I could I could get past. I could just get past. If if I knew a guy was from um, wherever, you know, deep down in the South, uh, you know, I knew that he had a background. He had background issues and I could have had those same issues, but I didn't. I didn't have parents like that. They didn't teach me how to hate. They taught me how to love people. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that answers your question. It it, it does, and, and we don't have to, to dive too deep, but I'm just always curious because of the time period. You're playing at Vanderbilt in the late 70s. You're in the NFL in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and, and forgive me if I misspeak what I'm about to say, but you're playing for the Patriots, which the city of Boston is not necessarily known for its hospitality, even for African-American players. Look how Bill Russell was treated in his early years, did you ever, I guess, were you ever either witness or victim to any of that by fans? And see, and that's the thing. I, I don't know if, if, if they just liked me for whatever reason and they gave me a pass, but I didn't necessarily experience in the, any of that stuff because I was a New England Patriot and those people were crazy about the, the Patriots. I mean, they would do anything for you. And, and, you know, I guess a friend of mine, he said it best. If you were a football player, you you got to you got to pass because mm -hmm. people treated you differently. They treated me differently. Now I don't know how they treated my fellow man and my fellow. I can only like I'm saying I can only speak for how I was treated when I was coming up, and I was treated like, hey, there's Preston Brown right there. You know, I was treated like that. Thank thank God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, it was only his, by his grace, 
is is the reason why I was treated that way. It was nothing that I necessarily done, but I try not to be goofy. You know what I mean? I try not to be, that's my new word for the summer. I try not to be goofy, you know, when I was up there where I was trashing somebody or I'll never forget, and I'm not going to call any names, but uh, when we were playing for the New England Patriots, uh, there was this one bar that we would all frequent, and it was on Route 1 uh, after a game. And we after, Usually we would do it on, our off days were Tuesdays. So we'd either do it Monday evening or Tuesday, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But this one guy that was, was head of this establishment, I mean, and he hosted the New England Patriot players. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a couple of guys they just got out of control. They got drunk. Uh, the drink of the Patriots was tequila at the time. So you know what tequila will do to you. It'll make you crazy, man. It'll make you crazy. So uh, these two guys got mad, and they, here they are exposing themselves, goofy, and they're throwing cheese at the patrons and stuff like that. Well, this guy, we were banned from coming, going back to that establishment anymore. And it is, and it's only because a couple of guys that got out of hand, sure, sure. and um, and these guys they happen to be white, you know, because now then if I had done something like that, yeah. or if I had done something like that, yeah. then oh yeah, oh yeah, I would have been hated upon. <laughs> we got to stick with the Patriots for just a minute. I want you to take us Let's into the puddle with. He has to be the only quarterback I have ever seen who used to wear a neck roll. Of course, Steve Grogan. Yeah. And then largely considered one of the top five offensive linemen in NFL history, John Hanna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm picturing the three of y'all in the same offensive huddle. What was it like playing with Grogan or, or Hanna back in the day? Were and they then also they had they had all world Russ Francis was back there along oh, with how can I forget Russ Francis, absolutely. It it was uh, it was it was an it was an amazing time at that particular time because those guys were awesome uh, awesome talent. Uh, Steve Grogan, as you mentioned, he wore a neck brace, you know, because he was gonna, <laughs> you know, when when a quarterback wears a neck brace, that means he's gonna dish out punishment. Okay, that's a tough dude right there. That's a tough dude. Uh, and I had to mention uh, Russ Francis because um, when I first got there. Man, the wide receivers, we did a lot of running. You hear me, Bernie? We did a lot of running. Like if you ran a deep route, you were you had only so much time to get back into that huddle and then like listen to the play and then play, and then you go run another deep route and a crossing route and all this kind of stuff. And as a young player, perhaps I wasn't as in shape as I needed to be, maybe. Uh, but it, because when you get in an NFL huddle, there's additional adrenaline running that, that takes some of your breath away. And I'll never forget, I was hurting pretty bad in the huddle. And I'm breathing real hard. <laughs> and then I hear Russ Francis say, hey, hey, rookie. He said, are you, uh, are you going to stay with us on this play? Or do you need to go out like that? Because we're getting ready to score a touchdown. That's exactly yeah. what he said. Because we're getting ready to score a touchdown. Yeah. I said, man, I'll be here. I'm here. And uh, boom, I had to tell that story because uh, that's how it was. I mean, they would pick each other up and like, look, if you're not ready to score a touchdown, let, let's get somebody else in here that will. Preston, it was just a few years prior to you arriving is when Daryl Stingley mm. was paralyzed. Was that... Mm. That's still um, part of the culture of the Patriots, or had it, it faded by the? Because it was a couple of seasons later. Was it still very evident around there? Yes, it's still very evident. I met him also while he was in the chair, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it was still you know kind of sort of some bad blood because of what was said afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't kind of cool. Um, you know, when um, I forget who did it, but he, he came out with Jack books. Tatum. Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum. They call me assassin and all this kind of stuff. Um, and and there, there was just no need of that because he he temp, he injured this guy to the point where he could not earn a living anymore. Yeah. So, but yeah, that part of that culture was still there. Now, were people looking over their shoulders? It, like I said, Bernie, it was a different game back then. Yeah. And a defensive back. And if you notice, if you notice, they're starting to pay the wide receivers a lot more money. 
-hmm. And do you know why that is? A wide receiver nowadays is protected. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't take a bad shot. You can't take a shot to the head. You can't do all of that stuff. They will throw a flag or worse yet, they will throw you out of the game. Yeah. So yeah. that's why they're starting to pay wide receivers the same monies that they used to give quarterbacks some 10, yeah. 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, but back when we were playing, those guys would beat you up all mm -hmm. the way down the field if they could. And they would take take a shot at you almost every single chance that they get. So, and one of the things in the NFL, they wanted to see, were you going to be afraid if you went across the middle? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's where you got all your shots. And yeah. uh, you had to learn to protect yourself. I never forget, I was going across the middle and I was open as soon as I came out of my cut. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but Steve Grogan, he saw me late. And then I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't throw it now. Don't throw it yeah. now. You yeah. know, and he threw it, and I, instincts, I went up for it, and sure enough, I got clobbered, you know, yeah. but and those are the breaks that you have to deal with uh, well, in the NFL if you want to make a team. Well, Preston, we've had uh, Pat Tume was on the show a while back, and he told some some wild stories from during that time period. Yeah. One of the things I forgot to ask him, but it's more appropriate for you, you know, that was the onset of the era of using stickum and glue or whatever the materials were. I know that Fred Bolitnikoff and Lester Hayes after him, were you part of the, the Stickum time period or, or were you I, one? I the was. Receivers? Okay. I was going to say yeah, I was part of that. Receivers who just stayed away from that and was, was um, naked, if you will. You, you really needed to stay away from it because that was a hot mess. I yeah. mean, that Stickum stuff, what they would do is they would put it on their sock so they could go to their sock and grab the stickum and then put it on their hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but in doing so, you know, it started getting all over the balls, and they had to outlaw stickum because oh, Lester Hayes had it oh, exactly under arms. And I'm trying to figure out why would he have it? He's a defensive back, unless he wanted to get you all stickumed up. You easier know, to hold. Uh, easier to to hold the receiver. Maybe, but it was like. It was mostly <laughs> for catching a ball. Yeah. But now the thing is, when you start, when your hands started getting wet, I mean, it just was a hot mess and it didn't even do what it was supposed mm -hmm. to do. You know, you got to yeah. remember during that time also, they used to, they used to frown upon people that wore gloves when you were catching a football. And I'm like, you guys are idiots. You got to <laughs> wear some gloves. You know, those ball, that ball will tear your hands up and, and yeah. it would, and it did. But uh, it's a completely different game now. Completely, yeah. everything is catered to the athlete, which it should be, mm -hmm. but uh, because they're paying them so much money that yeah. you have to protect your investment, and that's just the name of the game. I'm just, I'm trying to think of your years in the NFL. Was Richard Todd your mm -hmm. quarterback with the Jets? He was with the Jets. Yeah, he, he threw a pretty good ball. Who was your your quarterback for the Browns? Brian Sight, maybe. Um, no, no, not Brian Sight. It was. Uh, Oh man, the lefty from Southern Cal. Oh, uh, his name is Paul McDonald. There you go. Yep, yep Paul yep, McDonald. Yep, yep, yes. Yep. How how quickly we forget. I'm getting old, Bernie. I'm getting old. But no, yeah, not. Paul mm -hmm. McDonald was the the lefty. He and uh, I was up there with Ozzy Newsom, the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. um, didn't have a lot of playing time at Cleveland. Um, that was an interesting year for me. Uh, and I had an opportunity to go back with him in 1985, but the USFL offered me something at Memphis that mm -hmm. I went ahead and said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and play for the the only Southern team that has ever been interested in me was mm -hmm. the Memphis Showboats. Because you've noticed I went to New England, yeah. then New York, and then, you know, Cleveland, you know, all these cold places. And I'm like, the hey. Showboats. That Marcus Dupree wasn't with you guys then, was he? No, no. Um, but we had Reggie White. I was, oh, that's what I was, yeah. Yeah. We had uh, yeah. Walter Lewis. Walter Lewis was a quarterback. Yeah. A lot of southern, southern, a lot of Southern talent. Yeah. They try, yeah, because yeah. they were trying to fill a stadium. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was some recognized uh, names. Oh, speaking of recognized name, Preston, we got Lee Edmondson is with us. Lee, how you doing, sir? He says to tell you hello. Preston, right. this, being a professional athlete, from mm -hmm. Vanderbilt has a little bit of a distinction. Obviously, not many guys 
are drafted or, or make their way into the NFL, but but Bernard and Dennis, and there were several others already in the league by the time you came through, and then some others yeah. came while you were there. Yeah. Was that when it, post game? Did you guys hook up? Did you recognize each other? What was the the Vanderbilt connection? Was it <laughs> by you guys? Because I assume maybe you knew each other either through name or actually knew each other back from campus during the days. No, the only time we would hook up would be in the off season, if anything at all. Because during the time, I mean, like if 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 we were flying into Philadelphia, which is where Dennis Harrison and uh, uh, Brenard uh, played. But we would fly out, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of time. You you might say something to them on the field, you know, but it was just kind of sort of all business, all whatever, and um, just straight up NFL kind of stuff. And, you know, you had a chance to visit with people in the off season, and that was about the extent of it. Mm-hmm. We, we've got just a couple more minutes, Preston, and mm-hmm. I appreciate your time so far. Uh, Gary yeah. Clark has just entered our chat. Hey, Gary, thank you for being here. Yes. I want to spend the last few minutes going back to the Vanderbilt days and and maybe letting you reflect a little bit about what it meant to you at the end of your Vanderbilt career and you knew you were going to go pro or at least had a very good idea you were going to be drafted, which of course you were by the Patriots. Mm -hmm. Did you have any, um, the word is not regret that I'm looking for, but were, were there any things that maybe you wished you would have done that you, because you played football and were so caught up in the football responsibilities, were there things maybe that the regular students got to do that maybe you wished you could have done if you'd had the time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would have focused on uh, education a lot more than I did. You know, when you already have a job, because I still needed nine hours to graduate. So I had to come back my um, after my first rookie year to come back and finish my degree because I promised my mother I would. And, I, and I'm glad that I did. Um, but what some of the things I, I really felt like that I would I could have been a very, very superior student, you know, if I had put my mind to it. And if that was my my total focus, because as soon as I got out of football, that's exactly what I did. You know, I started working on a, a master's in education um, here at Alabama A&M. I worked on a finance degree up in um, up in Chicago that I ended up doing something with, you know, I ended up with, um, you know, being a finance director at a, at a dealership for all of those years. But I was, I was amazed at uh, how much I liked learning different stuff. And, uh, and I could have learned those like, you know, 20 years earlier or 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. But the only thing about it, there was an end for me to play professional football. And I cannot, you know, I cannot doubt that I wanted to play professional football and I had an opportunity to play professional football now. And I wish that I could have done it a lot longer uh, than I did. But staying healthy and a lot of these young guys, they need to understand that in order to play professional football, you need, you know, you need a little bit of luck or God's favor um, Mm -hmm. because you're going to have to stay healthy in a violent game. Uh, the football is very violent and it always will be and it's always going to be. So you make your living, you get your money that you can get. But, you know, I was able to make a lot of money playing professional football, mm-hmm. not quite as much as making when I was in the car business because I stayed in it for 30, 35 years. Mm-hmm. So I was able to make obviously more. But um, but, yeah, I would love to have. Um, actually, I wanted to be an attorney. I, I wanted to go to law school at that particular time. And, and that's really what my passion was back then. So woulda, shoulda, coulda, all of those things. I don't, I have no regrets. I have a, uh, one of the chapters in, in my book, a champion game plan for life. No regrets, no regrets. I mean, a lot of times you're going to go back, you're going to look back of all the things you could have done, would have done, should have done. But the main thing is to, to live your life, love your life, and then to have no regrets at what you're doing right now. And just try to be the best version of yourself right now at whatever age it is. And that that sometimes is a tough thing for a lot yes, of people. Yes, I understand. La- last thing that I wanna get your, your thoughts on is, is the importance of the Pioneers weekend. 
It's yeah. coming up for the Alabama A&M game for September 1st and 2nd. Did yeah. you attend the first one that they had? Do you plan on coming uh, to the one they're coming in, in a couple of weeks? Yes, I, I did attend the last one that they had, and uh, it was just just awesome. And I plan on coming uh, this week as well. Uh, I actually know uh, Carnell Maynard, the uh, Alabama A&M head coach. Uh, we play golf together. He's actually a heck of a golfer, to be honest with you. Um, but um, they're, they're not going to win that game for sure, <laughs> I don't think. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that the uh, Pioneers, I, it, it's a wonderful thing that they're doing, being acknowledged, because, you know, even though I didn't have a bunch of issues, like I mentioned earlier before, but it's nice to be noticed as being one of the first African Americans, for example, on offense to be uh, a Southeastern Conference can, um, pick selection, you know, first team selection, third team All American, you mm -hmm. know, from Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of people don't realize what a great feat that is. I mean, because you're thrown into the mix with all these other people, and um, you know, they they try to be politically correct, and you've got a lot of guys that are going to favor a lot of Alabama guys and some of these other guys, sure. but. Uh, no, we've got a we've got a um, we've got some good things going on at Vanderbilt University. If people will just stick it out and um, just don't give up, as far as because uh, their time is coming, but you just can't give up. You got to keep on going until that time um, manifests itself. Yes, Preston, I, I couldn't have I couldn't think of a better conversation tonight. I wow, to thank you. Thank Thank you for sharing your story with us tonight. I really appreciate and it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, all I can say is uh, it has been a blessing. And uh, keep on doing what you're doing because what you're doing is awesome. It gives old dudes like me to, a chance to go back and reflect on some of the wonderful things that God has blessed us with. And, uh, and we just can take it from there. I, I do have one request. I want to see, I want to see that video. An isolated video of your 108 yard return against Ole Miss. I've got to see that at some point. But hang on with me before I, after I, I sign off. Okay. Guys, I, today is Tuesday. On Thursday, I've got the Anchor Impact uh, Fund. It's our NIL, the one that has just taken off. I've got the representatives uh, are going to be with me this Thursday on the show. So we've got two shows this week. So please look for that. It'll be at seven o'clock and I'm lining up Commodores all through uh, the, during the season. If you have any questions about tickets, parking, the game day changes on campus, get into the discussion in our group. I posted every, all the Q and A, anything you have questions about will be in there. And of course we've got a big week a weekend at UNLV in mid-September, all kind of fun activities. But uh, please keep coming back on Tuesday nights. It uh, this These conversations are just invaluable. Thank you again, Preston. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for having me. Thank Peace, you, Peace, everybody.